I'm going to talk about um, React, and for those who don't know what React is, it's a JavaScript library um, for building UI from Facebook, and it lets you write your UI in a uh, declarative way, and it's really good at managing complex view hierarchies and complex UI. Um, so to kind of bullet point what I'll be going over, I'm going to start and give you kind of an overview of what is React, what are the pieces that make it up. I'm going to demo how you might take an existing application and add React to it. Um, I'm going to sort of demo how you would build a React app from the ground up. I'm going to then demo uh, how Artsy uses React real quickly and wrap up with some of the, the wins that I think React brings. So there's going to be a little bit of slides in the beginning, but a lot of code in the middle, and I encourage you to stop me at any point if I'm moving too fast, and if you have any questions. So, what is React? Uh, React is a couple things. For one, it lets you write your UI in a declarative way, and what does that mean when I say declarative? Um, in React, you describe the state of your UI, and you write your um, view, your HTML, and it sort of, this machine underneath interprets that and creates the UI for you. First, what you might be more traditionally used to on the client side in JavaScript is a more imperative way using jQuery, which is like hide this thing, add some HTML here, you're constantly manipulating things explicitly, whereas React is more declare this thing, machine runs, it builds the UI for you. Um, the other, another key component of React is what's called the virtual DOM. And so the virtual DOM is a way to performantly make updates. Um, so, this is uh, this crazy, the crazy magic that underlies React. And it's basically a mini DOM API in pure JavaScript, except it doesn't include all of the, the entirety of the DOM, it just includes the part that's needed to render it. And the way it maintains its performance is by computing the differences of updates through React and only making the minimal amount of manipulations to DOM that it needs to, because the DOM is the most expensive thing in JavaScript programming. JavaScript has gotten a lot faster over the years, and DOM still is very slow. Um, so React does its, be its best not to manipulate the DOM when it doesn't need to. And so how did Facebook come up with this? Well, they actually referenced game engines and graphics engines. And here's a, a piece of um, an image I stole from one of the React demonstration slides that is making parallels to Doom 3 game engine and to how React works. So in Doom, in the Doom 3 engine, you calculate all of your state outside of graphics, and then you actually do the rendering as minimal as possible after you batch up the diff of the state of the world. Similarly, React does all of its state calculations in the virtual DOM, and then it applies the minimal amount of diffs to the actual DOM. Um, finally, the, one of the key components, or the key parts of React, is what's called a component, and this idea of building a component hierarchy and building and uh, encouraging a one-way data flow. So, in other JavaScript MVC frameworks like Backbone or Ember or Angular, you might do an event-driven architecture where you're making updates to a model that's linked to a view. The view makes uh, binds to events on the model to update itself and makes manipulations on the model to update more views. React tries to take a slightly different approach where it encourages this unidirectional data flow and trickling data down your view hierarchy or component hierarchy. Cool. So is the you say it's the virtual dog internally is actually is it computing the whole component model hierarchy every single time then? 
So this is kind of how React's virtual DOM magic works, is by building up this big component hierarchy, um, React can say there's one piece of uh, state change down here, and React will update the tree and only make the manipulations the DOM that needs to, instead of in, say, maybe a very complex event system, you might have once thing changes here and it starts triggering things in the entire view hierarchy or lack of hierarchy, depending on how messy the code base is. Um, so, what are components then? Um, this is the building block of React. It is essentially to the, the main piece that makes React. It's, React kind of describes itself as the B of MVC if you want it to be. And so components are, for one, they're, they couple your, um, your HTML and your CSS, some people even inline, or HTML and JavaScript, sorry, and some people even inline CSS into their components. So it's kind of like, you've ever heard of web components which are spec for um, browsers in the future that are trying to encapsulate UI and couple together the related HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. <coughs> React is sort of pushing in that direction by coupling things logically in sort of conceptual ways instead of breaking them apart by uh, type of file, for instance. So I tried to sort of illustrate this idea. In React, you kind of have to think of it simply for those who are familiar with Backbone, it would be like having your template embedded inside your view, but your template has all the power that JavaScript has instead of being something like mustache that is more meant for just describing HTML. Whereas in like a more traditional NBC, you might be pulling pieces from all over the place to build up a piece of UI. React kind of tries to couple those pieces into one self-contained module. Can you uh, describe the difference between a template and a view in your conceptualization or right. React perhaps? Yep. Uh, so that's a good question because often the server a view is referred to simply as the HTML in many client side JavaScript frameworks. Um, the template is kind of the equivalent of a server side view. It's the described HTML that comes out of it. And for instance, in Backbone, their views actually act more like controllers and they're sort of the um, thing that wraps DOM events and um, does the rendering or ties together models to the templates. So on the client side, some, sometimes people actually refer to view, refer to these models as views when they're technically more like controllers that lead into sort of view territory. In React though, this is all coupled together. So React will have your template embedded inside of a sort of controller. It'll probably make more sense when I get a new code. Yes? Uh, I use React now for your script. I know the problem facing is I have a designer who is scared of code. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, I like the smart but it's coupled together. Now I can't separate the design from the code. Yeah, so Facebook, um, I. Personally, at Artsy, we have us. We don't actually have designers adding, doing a lot of HTML. But Facebook uh, tries to solve this problem by introducing a preprocessor called JSX, which lets you write HTML inside of your JavaScript. And I'll show you how that looks very soon. And they claim that uh, designers are just as comfortable with JSX as they are with HTML and CSS. Um, and finally, components have two key parts to them, two uh, sort of types of data that they manage, and this is called state and props. So state is data that changes over time, and React encourages that you try to keep your state as minimal as possible inside of the component. So it's simply a hash that describes whatever state your component is in. Something that might go into state could be domain data such as a collection of favorites, or it might be strictly view states such as is this modal open or closed. 
Either way, both of those things might change over time. Uh, props, you can kind of think of it. Sorry, was there a question? No, no, it's just that I was curious. So, in a sense, it hashes every uh, aspect of the DOM as a hash? So, it doesn't describe the DOM, but it describes in. Maybe I can jump ahead and see if I can find a. Uh... <coughs> yeah, so. It, it's just a, a vanilla object that tries to, in a simple vanilla object way, describe the state of your component, right, and so that's the snapshot. Does each element has its own hash? So the state, the this. So <coughs> I'll get this in a second, but basically, you describe your DOM in like render in the render function, and you will assert, a, you will like do logic based on your state. So you might say if loading. UL, LI, else, spinner, but these things aren't necessarily coupled. This state is strictly data that describes the current state of your component, whereas so the DOM is. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, props for those familiar with background, you think of it as the options object passed into a view. For the most part, it's configuration or data that doesn't change over time. Okay, is there any questions before I jump into the actual code, which will be the meat of this? Cool. Backbone before? You raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have used uh, Ember or Angular or another client side JavaScript or MVC? Okay, so there's a maybe two thirds of you who are familiar with, at least familiar with some JavaScript client side MVC. Um, I'm going to demo how you would take an existing Backbone UI and introduce React to it. And then I'm going to show how you build the action ground up. So for those who aren't familiar with Backbone or client side MVCs, please stop me at any point if things are getting really confusing. But um, hopefully, it won't be too crazy. <coughs> I'm not going to dive too much into Backbone. I'm going to try to show how React might be introduced into a, a client side MVC. Um, so let's start with uh, showing you this little backbone app we have here that this is actually sort of a UI Artsy had at one point, which is a favorite in UI. Of course, there were a little bit less kittens on the site at the time. Um, blow this up a bit. So here you have this uh, thick point UI where you can favorite the kittens you like, and in the bottom you have a tray of your favorites, and they both are in sync. Rendering wise. Uh, so, to quickly run over what that looks like, this will probably be a familiar sort of setup for those familiar with Backbone. we have two collections. Collections, to quickly give a, a rundown for those who aren't familiar with Backbone, Backbone brings MVC to the client side. Essentially, at the guts of it, it's got a view layer and a model layer, and that model layer can have collections or models. Collections are just basically a wrapper around arrays for models. <coughs> and views, uh, like I sort of alluded to earlier, are kind of like controllers, but they play a little bit of a view role as well. Uh, and in terms of like rendering HTML. Um, so here we have two top level collections. We have a kittens collection, which represents this entire list of kittens. And we have a favorites collection, which represents the tray at the bottom. 
And I'm not going to dive too far into the code, but this is more of a typical background setup where you have an event-driven system. So we, here we have a list view. This represents <coughs> this UI with the list of kittens. And a tray view, which represents the tray at the bottom. And an initialized function here, which is basically sets up the app, passes in these top-level collections, and wires everything together. The views subscribe to events, as we can see here. If you are adding or removing to your favorites, it will re-render. And likewise, in the list, if you're adding or removing, it'll re-render or have some callbacks. OK, so again, don't get too caught up on the, for those not familiar with backend, don't get too caught up on it. Basically, essentially, there's these two top-level collection pieces of data, one that represents your favorites, one that represents the list of kittens. And two views, one that represents the list, and one that represents the tray at the bottom. So how would we, for the, this is like great, but we are really interested in React, and we want to introduce React to this background app. How would we start doing it? Um, well, before I dive into this, is, any, is anyone confused at this point? Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> The kid would look pretty confused to me. I'm not the strongest coders, but they'll catch up. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and jump into it then. So the cool thing about React is you can build your entire application through a huge component hierarchy, and React can scale to that level. But you can also introduce it in the tiniest piece of piece of UI into an existing app, existing application which is what we're going to do now. And in this case, let's try to replace this tray UI with React. So in Facebook Docs, they show you how to start building the simplest component you could with React. And that just basically starts with describing your HTML <coughs> output. So here they show you a hello message that just has a render function that returns a div with the name that gets passed into that React component. Um, and so to, for, to circle back to the, the JSX point here, um, someone asked earlier about how does Facebook deal with designers who need to adjust uh, components in HTML. This is JSX which lets you inline HTML into your JavaScript and it's sort of like mustache or handlebars or some kind of template language embedded right inside your JavaScript. And it's a preprocessor and there's a couple ways to enable it in your app. Uh, personally, I'm going to be using what's called Browserify, which is a node module. Node is JavaScript and server side that will read my JSX and output. It's a command line tool, read my JSX, output some pure JavaScript. And if you're interested in that, I talk to me afterwards, I can tell you details how to set that up. Um, so, going off this, the first step to introducing a React component into an existing app or in general, in building any, any React component whatsoever, is to start with this render. So we're going to start by just trying to render out the UI that the other background view did. So to reference the old background app, you can see here, here's our tray view, background view. It's got a template, underscore templates, which are like EJS or ERB. Um, and it's just a UL with an LI that iterates through our kittens and outputs some images. So likewise, in our um, JSX, we're going to do something similar, where we have a UL that goes through our favorites, maps them into LIs, and spits out images. So this is like the most basic beginning of adding React, we've replaced our backbone view 
here with a static component that just renders out some HTML. And so what does that look like when we replace that? So here I'm just running the JSX tool to create some uh, proper JavaScript and output the uh, React component replacing our backbone view. So you can see here I have I actually add a little kitten to my collection for to start with, just using good old backbone conventions, but uh, nothing works in the, this component. None of it gets updated when I'm favoriting. I can't remove kittens. So the next step is actually adding functionality to this. Um, any questions before I jump into that? Yeah, where's the uh, style? This is currently just coming from uh, CSS file, as you would any. Oh, so you're starting to show the elements first. So no, this is this is like this old school vanilla way, CSS being referenced in a link file. But some, as I, when I was saying earlier, some people like to even do <coughs> like this kind of thing because you can actually use JavaScript to dynamically create adjust styling, which can be actually really useful if you're trying to do some fancy animating things or whatnot. It's, there's some powerful things you can do when you actually copy these pieces and leverage JavaScript for things like CSS. <coughs> So create class is creating a view, right? Create class is the same as the backbone view here? Yeah, so this React create class is basically the same as, essentially equivalent to saying like backbone view extend. Okay. Uh, it's the clarity component. But uh, you do bring up a good point. I didn't mention how this component gets added. And that is um, by using React render. So in their, their example doc, you can see they create the class, and then they use React Render to play the component, <coughs> and then specify the, the HTML element uh, so that it's like the element that you so it's a render. Yep, exactly. So here you can see this is going to look pretty similar to what I'm instantiating in background view. This is the React form of it. and that's the. <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's it? Oh, uh, sorry. Why is it create class and not create view? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, there's an interesting like mix of functional and OO paradigms in React. I think they wanted to make it more appealing to OO, but I think at the heart, uh, React is like drawing a lot of functional ideas. In the um, snippet of code that's in the React documentation in the browser there, yeah. the, um, the variable that you have highlighted, mountain node, what is that? That is the, um, the DOM element. So, when you, so you can see here with jQuery, I'm specifying. I see. So you're just picking yeah, the DOM is, element out of the jQuery. Exactly. Collection. So when you use React Render, like if you have a full, right. fully React wrap, or app, this might be like body. And mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. from there, React takes it okay. away. So but it's just a reference to the DOM element. Yeah, exactly. All right. Good question. Yeah. Um, I can't read it from here. Is this an HTML file or is this just a JavaScript file? So this is just the JavaScript file um, okay. it, or the JSX file that it's output to the JavaScript file. Okay, I was looking for the required text stop. How are you getting so, the verified work? Uh, I, I'm just I'm just using browser pie transpiler okay. because I'm familiar with browser pie. There's no require action going on here, but I'll show you that and I'm gonna test the React app at the end of this and we'll see how that works. Cool. Uh, so the next step is to add some functionality to this. So um, in this case, we're introducing React to a pretty typical backbone app, and we're not going to try to get too deep into the React philosophy yet. We just want to 
replace a chunk of UI to get our feet wet after that. So how do we get it so that this renders when you favorite kittens? It's not doing anything right now. Um, you can use React very simply like you would a vacuum view. As you, you're, as you create more React components, it becomes less encouraged to do this because, again, the whole view hierarchy and one-way data flow. But if you're just introducing a small chunk, it's OK to do uh, use force update. And so force update is essentially like calling render on a backbone view. And so this is going to look familiar, again, to those who are familiar with backbone or a similar event to NVC, concept NVC. Um, this is essentially going to be the equivalent of doing this kind of thing. We're binding to add or remove, we're calling, and then we're calling render on add or remove to this collection. Likewise, in our React app, uh, sorry, we're jumping around so much. Uh, we're binding to add or remove, and we're calling the equivalent of render on the component. So, Again, this can get messy the more you try to use force render. It's kind of an anti-pattern, but for something so early and simple, it's totally fine. So this breaks the React kind of internal rendering engine then when you do set off force update? So it doesn't necessarily break anything, but as you create larger view hierarchies, it can start to get tricky to track down where updates might be happening. So it's like the go-to statement and see that. I guess. Sure. Or like any other kind of yes. Or like any other Right, good question. Sorry, I tried to cover that. So, uh, like I was saying earlier, there's two parts to a component. State and props. Props be the configuration you pass into the React component. So, um, the when you declare, it's sort of like, React components are sort of written like HTML elements. And so when you declare attributes on it, <coughs> those are counted as props. So in our case, here, the only prop we had is favorites, which is the backbone collection we're passing into the component. So we reference it by this props. So, so let's start. I'm sorry. When you have uh, var self equals uh, this there, Yep. I don't see self referenced. So this is just in JavaScript, scope is a pain in the ass <laughs> yeah. to manage. So when you have a callback like this, you will often lose your scope. This is, no, and so I you have to make it. I meant uh, uh, down below under render. Yep. Oh, I mean, that's just. Because uh, I didn't see it reference. <laughs> I think that was just cropped from before. Oh, all right. Good so. catch. Right. We're doing some code review. Or <laughs> okay. okay, so before you said there was going to be states and props, state changes props down, but right. the fields attached to prop don't change, but the values of those fields can change. Yeah, so okay. yeah, it's, it's, this is, and even Facebook like says this is one of the hardest parts about getting started with React, it's kind of wrapping your head around the difference between state and props. So props can change up the hierarchy. You can change some values up a component hierarchy. Like you might have state at your top level component. It has the state of like, um, let's continue with the kittens. Like you add a kitten to your top level component and that might pass the kittens back down to another component that doesn't actually care, doesn't actually change the kittens, but it just wants to read, read only from the kittens coming down. Those you'd pass through props and just read off props. So it's, it's kind of like a, you, you inherit, the, the child components inherit the state of their parents as props, right? So. Yep, often that would be the case. And in fact, I'll show exactly how that happens in building a full React set. Does it also make sense to kind of think of it like um, a component can change its own state? But it should never change its own props. That's yeah. That's actually a very succinct way to put it. But it can change the props of components that it, in turn, down the down the chain, it controls can or creates state as props to the Right. Components. Right. Okay. 
is, is there anything that causes props to be musical? Or there are very good conventions that just like. Yep, that is a great point. And uh, for those interest, who are interested in closure script, that's that thing's to be made for code, like the opponents of. Yeah, yeah. There's also a mutable, a mutable JS, and there's a lot of really cool things you can do when you introduce <coughs> the immutable paradigms into React. But it's not a requirement to use React. In this case, we're doing very mutable things using background and just mildly introducing that. I have just a syntax question. Um, your LI return, when you write the return, you don't have to see around the LI implications. Oh, you don't have to wrap them? Well, no, no. That's what you're doing up there, right? Oh. It's there's no quotation around the HTML that you're returning, or if there's a parenthesis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the preprocessor that handles all of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this, like, in a non preprocessor look like this, it's building up strings. Mm -hmm. But this is using JSS. Like, this is why I have to run this thing in the console to output it. So, so React is going to take your JavaScript. It's going to read it into some other just normal JavaScript, and then it's going to run that. Yep. So this is what the output JavaScript. And you don't have to use JSX, but this is helpful for designers who are doing with HTML. So you can see this is the output JavaScript. It looks just like. Normal JavaScript only uses the verbose React Create element and stuff. Cool. Um, so, running this is essentially similar to what we did with the background app. Wires up events and it re renders as your favorite things. So, we're getting closer to what our background app was like. Um, finally, we're not having anything happen on remove. So this will be a good opportunity to introduce how event handlers work in React. And so in our background app, for instance, or using jQuery, you'd be familiar with this kind of thing, where you have a DOM event attached to an element, and then you have a callback. Um, in React, it's pretty similar, but because we have our virtual DOM inside of our components, it's actually just right inside of the JSX or React description. So that actually ends up looking more like um, this, where you have something that looks more like a template language on click, pass in the brackets, and then de describe the callback to the on click, which is self.remove favorite. And so again, this is the equivalent of that remove function in the view. It's just going to do remove the kitten from my favorites. That collection is referenced through props. And we're now in a state that looks exactly like our background app. Yes. So this is like transpile or whatever. Uh, is that on click actually on the DOM element, or is it like written to some JavaScript event Like if you inspect that element, will it have an on click function on it? Or will it um, so that's a good question. I'm not 100% um, sure the inner workings of how React is this, but yes, essentially that, like if I run some jQuery here, Oh, I just lost it. Do I just inspect the other? They were cool. We could probably see it in the source. Yeah. 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 yeah, so this is like, you can start to see how React is building up its own little DOM, but again, it's going back to the whole there's a virtual DOM that React batches up some disks and then outputs an actual DOM and it attaches a event handler. <coughs> So for all intents and purposes, clicking on this LI is the same sort of setup that you might have in a jQuery or background app. But with React's virtual DOM, it's really smart about being able to clean those event handlers up and re-render a new DOM and actually output anything. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so um, this, how do you like debug this? <laughs> uh, is it like all just magic? <laughs> Uh, so 
they're re actually Facebook is building a set of Chrome plugin tools to be able to inspect and debug the virtual DOM as simply as you could the real DOM. But personally, having used React extensively, I actually haven't found it to be a pain in the ass to deal with the virtual DOM. There's always it's, console log, right? Yeah, there's console log. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's surprising that I haven't been frustrated by not having insight into the virtual DOM, but it's one of the few like magical abstractions that I have yet to like, yeah, <laughs> suffer. Have you uh, had a situation where you want to inspect the style, right? You want to go back and see what's causing it. But in the style sheet that you have, there's no real encapsulation, right? Right. An ally outside this component would be styled like an ally inside this component. Yes. So if you have a couple of components, you might want to Modify the styles for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. So have you run into that situation? Or so? Sure have. Yeah. Um, well, actually, the one of the ways I handle uh, styling conflicts is simply just adding namespaces, namespace by your component name, to anything you're adding to a React component. And I actually structure my projects in ways that the CSS and the React elements and the text are all in one directory. And so it's very clear to see namespace all the CSS under this directory by this name. Just a small <coughs> old school namespacing pattern. With that kind of pattern, what happens with styles that will apply across multiple domains? So let's say that you have uh, some base font styles that right. you want to use. Are you doing some sort of uh, variables in JavaScript that you're using? Right, or like how, how would you make those uh, dry? Yeah, right, so yeah. I haven't delved into this yet, but Facebook also has a project that tries to solve all these problems by basically like free processing, namespacing, your CSS, being able to reuse variables between JavaScript and CSS. Um, Personally, I've gotten by very well with just this simple namespacing pattern and just treating, so let's say you have a global style that's like text topography styling, that would be coupled to your top level component and you would namespace it by the top level component. So if you have a huge view, view hierarchy of top level components in the app, you would include global style sheets with the app component and namespace it by app. And are they then available downstream yep. or? Yeah, it's just a, this is just like a very simple thing to pattern. And I can show you when I get into the actual React app. Like so you're using, so you're using, let's say you have app as a top, and you have some component, you're using app and make sure you want to reference that. Yeah. Okay, got it. And then if you want to encapsulate, then you just give it the name space of the subcomponent? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's literally just like if it's uh, coupled to the component, but then actually it isn't reused really outside of it. Namespace by component. If it's used elsewhere on the tree, namespace of that's in the tree. I think you explained this already, but back in your code, yep. I just want to make sure, this seems really important. I want to make sure I understand it. Line 86 looks like you're mutating the props. Yes. Why, why, explain why that's not the case. So this is going back to like an anti pattern where this very simply introduced in React as, as simply as we can to existing back in app. In a pure React app, or like the React way, you wouldn't want to be mutating props, but because we're just passing, we're kind of like punting on this issue and just passing our backbone collection into it as props, mm -hmm. then we're mutating within that backbone collection. So. Okay, so this is the case where actually you are mutating the props, but yeah. it's, so so this it's is sort of a... Yeah, so this is technically an anti-pattern, yeah, yeah. Okay. but it's sort of like okay. how you introduce React. Right. Got it. But, but changing or moving like the, the kitten is actually forcing an event in the collection, which is then getting passed and then causing a render. Yep, exactly. It's, this is basically like the easiest way to swap a view in a more typical event-driven architecture with a React component. Soon I'll show you what it's like to do it in the React way. Just one quick question. Yep. When you do the force update, it's re-rendering the entire thing, right? Or yep. is it just re-rendering that one little bit? Just the, just the component. So force, if you called force update up the tree, where this isn't, doesn't have a tree yet, it would re-render all the subcomponents. 
And when you say when you're angry, you mean what's doing your dick? Um, it's doing, uh, it's doing an actual. It's doing manipulations in the virtual DOM, and it's outputting a diff, and it makes minimal changes to the actual so, DOM. So it is, like, because you add one element, it's not going to re-render. If you add one element to a list of nine, you know, cat models, is it going to re-render? Is it going to render 10? Or is it going to just render that new one? Do you know what I'm saying? Right, so the actual DOM manipulation is, I mean, I'm not sure what the most efficient way off the top of my head of that would be, but it will probably just, like for instance, if it's just the inner HTML of the single LI, it will just change the inner, inner HTML. And Facebook is constantly upda like updating this virtual DOM to be more performant and smart about how it treats the diff and calculus the final DOM equations. Cool. So, um, yeah, that's that's implementing React in a very simple way into an existing uh, backend app. And now I think I'll dive into React from the ground up. Are there any more questions before I get into that? Yes. Uh, so, like, this is a JSX transformer thing. Does yep. that always exist on a page, or when you like push production, do you like compile it? Yep, you, you output to JavaScript and you run your minifying and all that. So this you, this is the first step to that like build process where it outputs for JavaScript and then you run some task of minifying and juicing and whatnot. Here's one question. Uh, so this is my question. Uh, what is the difference between the virtual DOM and the actual DOM? Sure is. Potential limit on the server. Yes. And then push it. But if it's still on the client, what implications are there for like SEO? Are there anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the great eternal question of client side apps and SEO concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so, the great thing about React is with its virtual DOM, it has a method called render to string that's like this, only instead of specifying a DOM element and adding it to the actual DOM, you do render to string and it outputs an HTML string. So given that you, in this case, if you can't use backend on the server, you're not going to be able to render your component on the server. But if you're using vanilla data or you're not using a lot of client-side only stuff, you can actually use React on the server and render everything on the server or render pieces on the server and optimize initial page load and SEO. And at Artsy, we don't explicitly do this with React yet, but we definitely do a lot of this, what's called isomorphic JavaScript, shared rendering and stuff. Cool. So that, to answer your question, the implications are, if you're willing to put in the effort, you definitely can optimize SEO and page load and do server-side and client-side rendering. It's pretty difficult, um, but if you set out the right way, it's not too insane. However, a lot of people like to argue various ways, one way or the other, that if you're building something that's stateful and client-side heavy, you might be building an application that doesn't need SEO, but in my opinion, you're, you can do it if you and definitely, like it's not invalid to, and you should. With and especially in Artsy's case, we need to. But that's a different topic. Um, okay, so building a React app from the ground up. Uh, we've just finished introducing React in a small way to our backend app. We're in love with it. We want to do it all the right way. Um, so. The way we're going to approach this is actually pretty similar to how we introduce React into our background app. Uh, we're going to start with going back to this, the very simple render. You always start with what is just try to get some HTML output, render a static component or a static tree of components. So here we go. Here's step. Oops. Here we go. Here's step one of a React app rewriting our this the same app we just had in Backbone and completely React. So we're not even going to use background models or collections. At the top, similar to top level of collections, we now just have top level vanilla data. Uh, don't mind this, I'm just pulling out a fixture of data to get things started. 
Um, this is the full list of kittens, which is this whole list here. And again, the favorites, kittens at the bottom of this tray. Um, and we just want to start rendering something. So I'm going to start rendering some scaffold here. So again, we now that we're in <coughs> full React, we're going to build a hierarchy of things. And so we have our uh, list view, which is or list component in this case, which renders the list and deals with all of the state involved in this list. We have a tray component. There's a list component, tray component that deals with the state of this UI down here. And now we need, since those are just kind of floating around on their own side by side, we now need a top level component to finish the tree. So we're going to create an app component that does not much more but handle stuff that the two things share and acts as a parent. So in our top level component, you can see <coughs> we're adding the list. And this should look familiar from when we did our render at the bottom of the previous app. Basically, again, with JSX, you kind of describe, describe your components in an HTML-like syntax. And in this case, you can now build uh, DOM hierarchies <coughs> referencing other components. In this case, we're referencing this list component and this tray component. And for starters, we're just going to render the list. So let's pass in our list of kittens as props from the app down into the list component. And here's where we actually go through the work to map our kittens into a bunch of LIs. So this is the function that returns some more JSX DOM, virtual DOM, and iterates through it, spits it out into a UL, adds a little next page button. And for our tray, we're just going to ignore it for now and add a little container. Does that all make sense so far? Uh, just a question on the tray. Yep. So right now, there's properties available on the list. Yep. Does the tray already have access to them, or are we going to have to explicitly give it access? We're going to have to explicitly give it access. So right now, because we didn't pass in this down here, we have no props on the tray. So it's just this stateless component. It has nothing going on but a static div. Yep. So the JSX knows about local variables. And if you put, like, I know things like this, then we know that's props. Yeah, yeah. So JSX can, yeah, it definitely knows about local variables. And you still have to do the passing around self and whatnot, but Essentially, you, anything you write inside here has access to this code. Cool. So let's take a look at what that looks like. OK, I'll put some J, run my uh, preprocessor for JSX. And so here we have a list of, let's see if this is the right app. I don't think this is the right app. <laughs> OK, that's not good. Um, so here, again, we added one little kitten to our list. And that component is rendering that one little kitten. Poor guy doesn't even seem to have a name. Um, <laughs> but you can see that all it's doing is iterating through this one element in the LI, spitting out some DOM. Our tray is just the container at the bottom. It doesn't even have anything going on. But at least we've gotten our view, our component hierarchies built up. And now we can start to flesh out the rest of the app. So the next step will be to write some initial state. Um, our kittens are going to change over time. We're going to favorite some of them. They're going to update our favorites, so our favorites have state. Our kittens might get a next page, so that's some state. So both of these things <coughs> are going to be treated as a form of state down the line. Uh, so step two is let's add some state to our list. Let's focus on the list. We'll deal with the tray later. Uh, for starters, React adds this function, get initial state. This is how you declare what the 
initial state of your component is. Again, state is stuff that changes over time. So in this case, our kittens, which is this list of kittens, is going to change over time because we might hit the next button and get the next page of kittens. Um, component did mount. This is what's called a life cycle function in React. And that a life cycle function lets you hook into the life cycle of rendering in React. So you might have component did mount. Like, I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but after render, before render, component did update, et cetera. So you're able to hook into sort of every step of this process. And in this case, we want to, this is essentially the equivalent of an initialize and background view. In this case, we just want to start by getting the next page. This would be like fetching the next page of kittens. So we call this next page. Uh, our render pretty much looks the same, rendering out the, the kittens. But in, in this case, you'll notice something different. We moved kitten.props because we knew it was going to change over time. We made it into state. And so now we're rendering based off the kitten state. And finally, to show how next page works, um, so in this case, we're actually not passing kittens down into the hierarchy anymore. We're starting with an empty amount of kittens. The list cares about the state of kittens. Nothing else does. So the list is going to get the next page of kittens and update itself. It's the only component so far that cares about kittens. And so here we do. Here you can imagine doing something like Ajax call and passing data into your component. So let's create some fixture kittens here. Uh, we're going to create a new array of kittens based off the current state of kittens. So we have 30 new kittens, and currently we have no kittens, and we're going to add those 30 kittens into our current zero amount of kittens and update the state of our component by doing this set state, which is going to update the kittens to the new concat kittens. And that will cause the component to re-render. And this is basically the general like lifeblood of writing re stateful React components, is you use this set state, and React is able to calculate through the various hierarchies <coughs> of this set state what needs to be updated, and a whole tree can just kind of trickle down and the whole UI can be updated in an efficient way. Um, so I'll go ahead and show what that looks like and then open up for questions. So here you, we did our initial uh, fetch of kittens, fetch, which was calling next page, and we did component mount. So that's why you're seeing this first list. Um, we haven't added. Oh, OK, one more piece. So in our button, as if you remember how event handlers work, we've also wired up the next page to the button click. So when we click this next button, it will run this bit of code by creating a new array of kittens with the concat kittens and updating our state with the new expanded array. So you'll get the next page on update. So does that all make sense so far? Yeah, next <laughs> Keep going. So it's kind of like you basically, in the backbone now before, you would actually just initiate all the kittens that you get a load, and then basically just render them out. Whereas now you're just initializing, this is an empty page, and then initialize to load up all the kittens. Um, so you could do something similar in Backbone. Uh, the equivalent in Backbone would be just adding to the kittens uh, collection, which we were doing, but I just didn't demo for the next button. Um, and likewise, you could do a fetch of kittens in the initialize function. The difference, subtle difference here, which makes bigger differences down the line, is that we're explicitly calling out what is changing. We're dealing with vanilla data. And we are explicitly updating kittens by 
concatenating and bringing out a new array and updating this internal state of this component. So this is all kind of self-contained in this component, whereas in the background in architecture, you'd have like this mop, this uh, collection, that's like this full of <coughs> that is that boundary that's rich. Again, it's subtle in a small scope, but in a larger scope, it can get really messy if you have a lot of events going all over the place, whereas in React, you build a very clear direction of state change and data flow, and you explicitly call out which parts of the component care about which uh, state changes, whereas in back, a more backbone events at app, you'd be like, events can go all over the place if you're not careful. Can you just go to the render function? Yep. I would, generally I use like browser private require things or not, but you know, I'm doing like this vanilla script tags added to uh, a DOM like old school style. Sorry. Um, okay, so, yep, go ahead. When you call it set state, do you have to pass in the entire state every time? Like let's say you have multiple variables. Mm -hmm. state. You yeah. Have to pass in the whole thing, or can you just pass in? So you can do uh, you can pass in multiple things like. Would you have to? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know. I don't know if you can do like this kind of thing. No, like if you had kidneys and food as your initial state, uh -huh. when you set state, you have to keep passing. Oh no, no. You can you can have. You can just pass in whatever you want to change. You so you just pass, pass in an object that has properties corresponding to the things you want to change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then deletion, deletion of fields on your state object are not possible. Yeah, no. So you will, you will the way in, the only way the only way you should manipulate your state object is through set state. Okay, yeah, but what I'm saying is if you can omit fields, then there's no way to oh. communicate the fact that you want to remove the fields. Right, so you would, you would like pass them all in that case. There isn't really, I can't imagine there's, or undefined, like I can't imagine there's much of a case where you actually want to delete the keys of a state object. Yep.
which is, sorry, one second. Um, <coughs> okay, I think we're going to move on to showing how the train works and then hopefully wrap up our app pretty quick here. So we, we did our list, got the next page going on, we have our, our state set up there. Um, okay, right, so now we want to be able to add to our favorites. Um, and we're still just concerning ourselves with just the list, the list component here. And so right now I'm not thinking outside of the box, I'm just a little concerned about the list. I'm going to add this to the state of the list and um, be able to add the functionality where, you know, when we click here, nothing's happening. So this will be an example of how um, we might update, for instance, internally inside this component, we want these things to be uh, favorited. So like we did before, um, we're going to have a event handler here on click, do on favorite. Likewise, set state, favorites are the padded version of the kitten. So now we're just adding to our uh, favorites data. Um, sorry, this one, I don't think I've thought this one out as much as the others. This is just going to be a quick demo of taking this a step further. So now we have favorite functionality. Functionality, um, very similar sort of to what we've been doing before. This component has its own state. Favorites change. The list of things that are favorited are changing through time. So we're using, we're adding the state and adding an event handler and a virtual DOM that calls set state to update that. Um, there, I'm, we'll go ahead and jump to the next step unless there's any questions about that. Cool. So let's go ahead and flesh out the whole thing. Um, sorry, this is going to be a big step we're going to take here. But basically now we want to start adding our tray component. And this happens all the time, uh, personally at least, when building out large React UIs is you have a piece of UI you account for, you realize that you're actually sharing some state between them. For instance, in this list view, we, we're sharing the favorites between these two UIs. So how do we deal with this? We started by adding all of that state encapsulated solely in the list component. How do I get that to be shared to the tray component? Uh, well, in React, it's actually, for the most part, you can basically rely on moving that state higher up the chain. So as you remember, we have this app component that's not doing anything yet, but combining these two. So what do we do to be able to share the favorites between the list and this tray component? We actually move that state up the tree into the app, and now the app is going to pass that down into its children. So here I've moved the state from of favorites outside of the list up to the top of the tree into app. And now we're passing those things in as here we are, as props. Yep. When um, a kitten is put into the favorite state, um, where do we put the or how do you put the label favorited there and uh, prevent and carry out the, uh, the selection and prevent yep. uh, the on-click from going through. Or is that done? Yep, so this is a good example of how React is declarative and not imperative. In jQuery, you might do element.add class, element.remove class. In this case, we just describe in our JSX um, if, the, if it's favorited, add the class, otherwise empty class. Right. And we check that by being like, is there a kitten in my favorites that uh, has the same ID as the one that I just put? 
And this, this code is, gonna, is all open source and on GitHub, so if you need to dive into more of the details, I definitely encourage looking at that. <coughs> um, so we moved our state up the tree, and now the list doesn't care about favorites anymore because two components depend on it, so we moved it up, and now we're passing that in as props. So all the times we reference this dot state dot favorites inside our list, we're now actually going to reference um, the props of this. Yes. Uh, from the top in this, there's like a one favorite that then kind of thing. As soon as it's in, right at the top uh, in the JSX, right, and then like root map. Yep. There's like one favorite. That's not like an opening event, right? Is that is that like setting an attribute and then this? Yeah, so I'll get this in a second. This is React uh, without adding more like flux, which is Facebook's larger architecture for being able to move things out of just the view hierarchy or run hierarchy. React encourages passing callbacks down the down the hierarchy to be able to do functionality. So I'll show you how that works in a second. Um, so yeah, it's a good segue. So now we need to um, be able to say, once we click on one of these favorited things, it needs to update the, this to say favorited, and it needs to add it to the, the tray. And so because the state has been moved up, um, that means the list is no longer responsible for favorites state, the app, the app top level component is now. So it also has to be responsible for what happens when you favorite things. And so we're gonna pass down a callback, we're passing in our on favorite function down into the child components here. And what on favorite does is it simply updates its state to add whatever kitten it, it favorites or is favorited. And likewise, when we remove a kitten from our tray, because the state is managed by the top level component, we have to pass down a callback to the tray, which is on remove favorite. Yeah. Sorry, on line 14 where you pass the callback to the list component, the, yep. this on favorite, is it binding the scope to that uh, instance? Because like it, it looks like it would be passing down without, you know, the like on line 24 references the Right, context. so I think uh, React implicitly binds Bind scope to, to when you pass in a function as a uh, property okay. to whatever that, that scope is. Cool, so by doing this now, instead of having our list say, set my own state, what we end up doing is we pass in this on favorite callback, and instead of having and before, we had a onClick referencing its own callback that did its own state manipulation. Now we're passing in a callback from the top down into the child component as a property, and it's basically saying, I'm going to call my callback. Here's the kitten you need that gets added to your favorites. So at a high level, when, whenever you need to move share state between two components, you move it up the tree, and that also means you're probably going to need to move callbacks up the tree because the components are no longer managing their own state manipulation. They need to just say, hey, parent, can you manipulate your state for me? So the on favorite label that we saw in the JSX up here, that becomes a property? That yes. A yep, exactly. So we're just directly saying my self props on favorite Call back with this kitten. Um, and so to wrap up with the tray uh, component here, all it's really doing now is rendering. Um, I guess I haven't implemented the removing of the tray, but essentially because we passed down our favorites into the tray, all it needs to do and because it doesn't manage the state of the favorites, so it's just a static component right now rendering the top level favorite state. <coughs> and so there's no, no fanciness there. And so 
just to take a look at what that looks like. Now we got our tray and our list. And aha, okay. Right, because we passed the honor move favorite as a callback, again, it's the parent's the one that's actually moving from the tray because it actually maintains this shared bit of state, which is the kittens or the, the favorites. So this is the one that sets its own state, that tells its children to update. So all this component needs to do is actually say, hey parent, here's the kitten you need to remove. And so all in all, we've probably saved ourselves like maybe seven, 10 lines of code from the backbone app to the React app. But the wins here are that as your app grows a lot bigger, it's a lot easier to reason about because you have a clear hierarchy and you actually end up reducing a lot of code down the line because you don't have to explicitly wire up events across a huge system. Um, so that wraps up my demo of React to Backbone and get React from the ground up. So, um, let's see. I'll go ahead, I'll just quickly demo how it's used at Artsy and I'll finish up with my last few slides. I'll go ahead and skip testing on my city, but if anyone's interested, grab me afterwards. Um, so how, this is how I use React and Artsy currently. We have a product that's called Artsy Writer. It's sort of like WordPress for Artsy. We have a whole um, upcoming super secret magazine effort, which is a way to premiumize our editorial. And so we've created, or I'm in the midst of building a rich article creator that we're dubbing Artsy Writer. So most of this is a node and backbone app, um, but the, this big portion of section UI is all React. And other portions like even small bits here where we might be associating this to partners little autocomplete widgets, these are actually tiny little React components. But this is the main like kahuna that does a bunch of React stuff. So you can see how this is like a large hierarchy of um, React components that are all working together. The network was moving out. Very beta. Um, and so these are all, this is all like this entire list here is, is like a list component. Inside of it is a session container component. Click into it, it's a text section component. Um, we have, for instance, in a case like this where there's various uh, components, like little UI inside of different UI, this is, these are little components that are like text area, rich text area components that are a part of this larger arbor component that's a part of the larger section container component that's a part of the larger section list component. So you can see how React can scale to big really, so can scale to make really large hierarchies. Um, cool, so to finish up here, I kind of already went over this. Um, but what were some of the wins of React? It's harder to tell on smaller projects. Uh, like I said earlier, it reduces boilerplate and event keeping, uh, bookkeeping as your UI gets large and complex. The one-way data flow is actually often a lot easier to reason about, especially in larger complex applications and say binding, like two-way binding. Um, you can basically write your UI as if you were rendering the entire tree or the entire element, not have to worry about performance with a virtual DOM. Uh, the components are really nice for reusability, composability, testability, because they use a virtual DOM. You don't actually have to boot up a Firefox browser and run around so you can actually unit test your components. Um, they're simple to start with. Like I showed, you can start small, but they're powerful even at scale without even having, having to add a bunch of overhead to it. And finally, there's neat things like server-side rendering optimizing page load. 
why not? So thank you very much. Output of React could be anything. Yeah, which is the cool potential for it. 